The first time I really questioned it, I was working on a project where we were measuring HIV in people's blood at this place called uh, Specialty Laboratories in Santa Monica. I was just an, a, a consultant there, and I came in about three days a month, and we were working on that, and at some point we needed to re-up our, our grant from the NIH to work on that, and I had to write it. And so the first line of that was, HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. And I wrote that, and then I said, well, I need a paper, some kind of scientific paper, to reference that statement, because when you make a, scientific, a statement like that, that's like a fact, you need to say, here's how come I know that, right? You put a little one, if it's the first statement you've made, and then you put down at the bottom of the paper, you have a one, and you say, here's a paper by somebody that describes why that statement's true, right? And so I said, to, I said well, well, what's that? I don't know, let me think about it. What is that paper? Who do I go to for that? And I looked around, I asked a couple of virologists at that company, and they said, no, you don't have to reference. I said, I have to reference that because I, I don't know where that came from. How do I know that? And it turned out that nobody knew it. There wasn't a scientific reference, like a, a paper that somebody had submitted with like experimental data in it and like logical discussion and said, here's how come we know that HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. There was nothing out there like that. Nothing. Can you talk about your experience when you met Luke Montenegro for the first time and you questioned him about his well, really got a reference for HIV since he is the one who By the time I met Luke Montagnier, I had met a lot of AIDS researchers at meetings, and I had always gone up to them. If they, if they talked like they knew about H, HIV and AIDS, I always went up to them afterwards and I said, where can I find a scientific reference that I can use from my, remember I said I had a sentence there, it said HIV is the probable cause of AIDS, and I needed to have that backed up by something before I could write it and submit it. And I went around, I asked a whole lot of people. I said, well, the people, you know, I can't find it. I, first I looked for it, you know, just in, in like computer searching kind of stuff like that. But then I said, there's gotta be somebody that knows this. You go to the experts and ask them. And so I asked all these people one after the other and none of them had it, none of them. And I was getting really freaked about that. That's when I first started saying, they don't know. Nobody really knows. This whole thing is a big sham. It's ridiculous. But then finally Montagnier came to a, there was a, a special little seminar down in San Diego where an old friend of Robert Gallo's, Flossie Wongstall, was opening up a Department of AIDS Research down in San Diego. They had big, lots of money involved, federal money. And they had Montagnier come there and give a talk. And after that they had a little wine and cheese thing. And I went over to Montagnier afterwards and I said, uh, Dr. Montagnier, I, 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 have a, I can't find a uh, reference, like who, I can't find a reference to go with the statement, HIV is the probable cause of AIDS, I, I'm sure you can help me. And he, he knew that he probably should be able to help me, and he said, well, why don't you quote this new work this, and by new, he meant like something that came out this year. Right? This new work about a, 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 a virus that can kill uh, monkeys. Or I think it was not monkeys, it was like uh, something related to monkeys, some kind of a baby, a little ape. And, and I had read that and I said that didn't, it was like supposedly gonna be a model system for studying AIDS. If somebody had figured out some kind of retrovirus that passing it back and forth between various mammals, they could, prob they could finally put it into chimpanzees and kill them. And it killed them in about a week, and it didn't kill them in any, there was nothing like AIDS there, you know? It, it doesn't kill you in a week. It was just it's totally ridiculous. It, none of the symptoms were the same. And I said, I said, well, you know, I read that paper, and I didn't, I didn't see any connection between that and AIDS, and I, and, I, and, I, and I don't think that would be a real, I wouldn't want to use that as a reference. And uh, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I know he walked away. Oh, no, before he told me about that paper, he said, why don't you use the NIH, like the, the CDC report? And I said, well, I looked at that, and that was not a scientific paper. And then he said, what about this other thing, this, this 
this like paper that had just come out about a month before and, and it a lot of fanfare associated with that paper, but it was total crap. It was like, yeah, if you got two million dollars, you can figure out how to kill a primate with a retrovirus. So what? Doesn't have anything to do with AIDS. It didn't look like AIDS, it didn't smell like AIDS, it wasn't AIDS. It was just like got a retrovirus that can kill a chimpanzee, so what? So I I didn't get any more out of him. He walked away after that. And the people standing around, by the way, who were his colleagues there, looked at him like they were thinking he should come up with a better answer than that. But he couldn't, and that's, he just turned around and walked away. I really thought he'd have an answer. I really did. I mean, that was my last... I was right at the edge of my, my faith in the system. But I thought, Montagnier will know why he thinks HIV causes it, and he'll tell me. He'll say, because of this study, you know, but he didn't have that. None of those guys have that, and that's why they're so, they're so weird, you know. That's why they don't want dissent. They don't want people like me walking up and asking them those kind of questions, and they're willing to, like, go to great lengths to prevent that. They're out on a limb. I wouldn't want to be there with them. I was given the mission to develop an HIV diagnostic test. Uh, and it was sort of an unspoken tradition at Amgen that whenever we would launch into a product development uh, effort, that we'd invite persons from both sides of an issue. And uh, the only person that I knew was uh, not entirely convinced that HIV was an important target was uh, Dr. Peter Duisberg. Uh, so I called Dr. Duisberg to uh, come out and give a seminar at Amgen, and um, he agreed. And it was at that time when he had introduced his uh, uh, theories about uh, other causes of AIDS and his beliefs that HIV was a harmless passenger virus. So that really is what planted the seeds uh, in my life to start questioning um, the link between HIV and AIDS. Um, and it was interesting at that seminar, um, the majority of the PhDs in the company actually boycotted the seminar. They had refused to come and be in the same room with uh, Peter Duisberg. And I thought this was odd because as a scientist, uh, we generally love vigorous arguments. And I thought that if persons uh, had arguments against Peter Duisberg, that this would be a perfect time for them to um, a attack him. Um, they did, however, let the research associates come to the seminar, and uh, it was just amazing. Everything that Dr. Duisberg uh, had brought to my attention was completely unknown to me. And uh, based on what he said, I was convinced that there were some serious problems uh, with the HIV-AIDS hypothesis, if indeed what he said was true. And that prompted me to go to the library, and that was about 12 years ago, and I've been um, studying this issue ever since. I remember when I made the shift myself, because for, for the first few years of AIDS, I was reporting on this story as a, from the conventional perspective. And then I learned from one reason or another, I had a chance to go into it more deeply. I spent a week in the lab of a, of a, a, a virologist in Germany who showed me the procedures that were involved in, in isolating and purifying viruses, showed me why he also didn't believe that, that this had ever been done with HIV. And um, gradually, I understood the intricacies of this story, and that allowed me to make the shift. But I, I remember being resistant to thinking that I'd been reporting this wrongly all those years. It, it takes a lot, of, a lot of, you know, kind of movement inside to be able to change direction on such an important and emotive issue as the cause of AIDS. From the very beginning of my medical engagement, I focused on family planning, sexual education, contraception, abortion, because I think this is the very basis of um, a happy life, to be able to control um, fertility. And in the 87, 88, we were confronted with reports that this new virus and this new disease was breaking out of the formerly so-called risk groups uh, of gay people and hemophiliacs and now, was now spreading among the heterosexual population. 
and um, I found that highly, highly unlikely and in contradiction to everything I had learned in medicine because the mode of transmission is predetermined and doesn't change easily and especially to say well now HIV uh, broke out of the risk group because the, risk, the people inside the risk groups are almost all infected suggests that the, the virus has some knowledge about how many people are infected and realizes and thinks and says well now I'm going to change my mode of transmission this is like us being stuck in a, in, 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 in a, in, in a car um, a jam, in a traffic jam, and deciding suddenly, well, now we can just fly because we can't move forward in, with our car. It doesn't make sense. And that's when I started to ask critical questions. And I didn't get satisfying answers, so I asked even more critical questions. And in the end I ended up to write a book, Do We Love Dangerously? To evaluate and bring together and analyze facts about and, and data available on this question. At the time the experts were claiming, this is 1999, that there'd been a quarter of a million deaths in that year alone, in South Africa alone. And so it struck me that if one could verify that that was true, it was obscene even to continue the debates, and that if I could prove that, which I thought was just a matter of a phone call or two, it would end the debate and the denialists and President Mbeki would have to sort of retreat uh, into the corner and wear dunce caps. So I went out and started looking for corpses, and that's many years ago, and I'm still looking today. Did you find the corpses? I, I didn't, and I believe that the claims then emanating from the AIDS establishment were entirely preposterous. But how can you say that when millions of children, millions of men and women, and orphans have been said to die from AIDS? Look, let's just step back and look at the broad picture. <clears throat> when I was still naive about AIDS, I used to open the newspaper and, and I'd read that some astronomical and dumbfounding number of Africans was infected with HIV, 24 million, 30 million, whatever. So what you discover is this doesn't imply that that many people have actually been tested. <clears throat> is, is what has happened is that it's assumed that that many Africans is theoretically connected via tortuous uh, mathematical models to a woman who tested positive in a government survey. What do you mean theoretical? Are you saying that those deaths didn't actually occur? I can't give you a yes or no answer on that. This is a Buddhist thing. You, you have to... This subject is, requires the wisdom of a Buddhist. You have to be able to hold two possibilities in your brain at the same time. It's very difficult for most people to do. I can tell you this, however. There are no statistics elsewhere in Africa. They simply don't exist. There are simply estimates generated by people who have a vested interest in, in keeping this, <coughs> in, in portraying Africa's AIDS problem as, as, as dumbfounding as possible. The sole exception is this country, South Africa. South Africa is the only country in Africa that has anything remotely approaching a, a, a vital registration system on the basis of which you can draw conclusions. So you're going to ask me about the numbers in the rest of Africa, I don't know. You can, you can make up anything you want about most countries in Africa. No would be, nobody would be any the wiser. It's almost impossible to check. You can sit in Geneva with your computer and generate estimates of whatever nature. They remain theoretical. This is the battleground. South Africa, South Africa is the exception. It's the only country in the entire third world where it's possible to assess the accuracy of these theoretical estimates against real-life death, death registration.